Um, how many people have actually heard of Agile before? Okay, that's pretty good. I hope you don't all know it already. But. Um, so, um, it's a programming language. I don't think very many people have used it in the past, but it's, uh, I hope, quite attractive to most Haskellers because it's uh, got Haskell-like syntax, which people like to say it doesn't matter, but it does in general. Um, Cock is a similar thing that has a ML-like syntax, and we don't like that. I don't like it. Um, um, it's got inductive families, which are sort of fancier GDT, and I'll get into that in a bit. Um, dependent types, which is what it's famous for. Everyone wants dependent types. A lot of people want dependent types. Um, it's total, meaning all Agda programs terminate, or almost. Um, and you can prove things with it, which is good for certified development and things like that. You you generally want to not rely on tests, or some people might not want to rely on tests because they only give you a sort of confidence margin rather than an actual proof. And so let's talk about the syntax um, just briefly. Um, on the left you have Haskell, and on the right you have Agda. And um, this is almost, I mean, it's, uh, it's Haskell with a few extensions turned on. It's Haskell with GDTs and time signatures turned on. But it looks pretty similar, right? It's, uh, you've got, you've got um, you know, maybe takes a type parameter, a type star, which is called set in Agda. Um, you have uh, the single, the double colon turns into a single colon. Um, and yeah, set is star. And um, by convention in Agda, you typically call constructors with lowercase um, letters. It's a lot more liberal about its naming than Haskell. So you don't need to start constructors in uppercase letter or anything. And um, also, we tend to call type variables with uppercase, um, uppercase letters here. So, um, functions in Agda are written just like Haskell. Same difference, you have this single colon, set. Um, um, here we have universal quantification over two type parameters set to, uh, um, and you know, this is standard maybe function for taking things apart. Um, and with any luck, it looks identical to you, or almost identical. Um, so, um, it also has this other really neat feature called mixfix. And so in Haskell, you define an inline and infix operator with um, sort of uh, any, any punctuation character in Unicode. So plus is an infix operator there, um, use an infix. In Agda, instead, you actually mark that it's going to be infixed by putting these um, underscores around it. And anything with an underscore around it can be used infix or mixfix, as I will show you soon. Um, and so this will actually parse as a prefix application of underscore plus underscore before five and six. And so this can get a lot fancier with something like if then else. Um, in Haskell, it's a primitive. In Agda, you just define it as a regular function. It's a function from Boolean to A to A to A for polymorphic A. And whenever you see, uh, see basically this, it's parsed as if then else, and it runs that function. Um, and so, yeah, that's just the definition of the function. Um, one thing that you're sacrificing by using this mixed fix are um, sections. Um, you can't, in Haskell, you can write plus one and it'll do one with, uh, it'll do pl call plus with one in the second argument. Um, in Agda, you typically have to write the functions explicitly. People have talked about um, adding sections, but it's already pretty complicated to parse Agda, so um, I'm not sure how, no one's terribly interested in this. Um, we also have something Pretty similar to pattern guards in Agda in, in Haskell. So uh, pattern guards were just added in Haskell 2010, or just added a couple years ago. Um, uh, they basically allow you to uh, bind a variable in in the left-hand side of, um, of a thing, but a more flexible and so a simple pattern match. So this is basically saying, um, if I have a, some function map for looking up, let's say, um, and it gives me a maybe, I want to say, well, if the map contains the key, and this other map contains the key, then uh, bind x and y to those variables and use one. And I'm not sure how many people actually use these in Haskell, but in, in Agda they're a lot more useful for reasons I'll get into later. But you can do almost identically identical things. You can say, these are the expressions I want to add to my pattern, and then I can pattern match them too. Um, is that clear? No? Oh. Wait. Is it like Rudicon instead of horizontal? It's uh, th this was just me trying to fit into into the stuff. So I mean, <laughs> this is you can write this over here. So um, this is one clause. This is another clause here. And, um, in Haskell, they're separated by by uh, pipes. And so um, 
you have your binding binding m bang k to just x and binding m bang j to just y in this clause. And in this clause, you're binding, you don't really care where you're binding. And yeah, the symmetry code is kind of lost because of that. But um, they are this, the, yeah, these, these two justs are these two justs and these two underscores and these two underscores. But no, you didn't have to repeat yourself as much in the active version. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I can just say bring, bring, these, uh, bring these expressions into scope in my pattern and then magically um, pattern match against them. So are those three periods, those are actual active? Yeah, that's okay. actual active. Um, and it's, it's not essential. I could have just repeated F MKJ, MKJ, MKJ under there. Um, it's, if it doesn't change, it has this you know, magic sugar here, which, uh, which gives you the same thing. You, and sometimes this will change under here. And in that case, you might want to not use the use the ellipsis. This, this ellipsis is just me lighting things. So, uh, so yeah, that was probably a bad idea there. Um, so um, miscellaneous syntax. Um, Agda allows overlapping constructor names. So I can have two data types with a constructor called true. Um, I can have as many data types as I would like with the same, uh, the same constructors. So I can have Lots of things which look like lists. You can have the plain old Haskell-like list um, with a colon as a as a constructor. Um, but you can have sort of size vectors and homogeneous, heterogeneous lists and various things like that, all with the same constructors. Which means if you ask for the type of the constructor, it doesn't have a type until the context requires it to have one. Um, so not everything has a principal type. Um, you don't have case expressions. Um, you don't usually miss them because of all the fancy pattern matching stuff you can do in uh, in function bodies themselves, it would be nice to have. I'm not sure why they aren't there. They just, no one got around to it. There aren't very many people working on it. Um, but they're doing a lot of interesting stuff that isn't some tech. Um, it's got very fancy pattern matches. It's, uh, as I mentioned, the guards, the pattern guards, um, along with dependent types, it becomes important to have a very flexible pattern language. And um, Agda has that. And sometimes it can be very hard to write patterns which type check. Um, I don't get into that. Um, and the code is sequential. Um, unlike Haskell, not all, everything exists at once in the code in the file. So if you define something up above, you can't refer to it above that. Um, if you define it up here, you can refer to it below. And you can optionally put things that are mutually recursive into a mutual block, which makes them all exist coexist peacefully. Um, and there's a few other uh, other minor minor uh, things like implicit arguments, which we saw. Uh, we saw back here, and this is this just means the argument is implicit, um, and it sort of behaves a bit like our for all k, but is more powerful. Um, so you could just say k is actually here. It happens to behave very much like set, but it could be an implicit argument of type map or some something else. Um, and I'll be going into that a bit later. Um, so um, let's talk about inductive families. So there, as I mentioned, there are fancier DADTs. Um, so if in case anyone hasn't actually come across the benefits of GADTs, I will just give a brief overview in Haskell and because they're pretty cool and I like them. Um, it just means that the constructor of a data type can refine type indices of the data type. So you have type indices like maybe A, and a constructor of maybe A might refine the A to be bool specifically instead of just anything. Um, of course, you wouldn't necessarily do that in maybe, but um, something like that. You get existential types for free just because they use them behind the scenes, and I guess they decided to make them exposed. Um, and one thing that they give you over alternative, alternate methods, because you can encode a lot of your sort of phantom, phantom type um, stuff, and sort of Oleg has a fancy way of doing it with type classes, um, um, and there are a few other ways you can sort of uh, approximate the thing, but one thing they don't give you is um, this fancy pattern matching. And fancy pattern matching is sort of the main interest to me um, in that it gives you additional knowledge simply by pattern matching on a constructor. And I'll go into what that actually means. And you use it a lot for um, statically representing invariants. You can do it to an extent in Haskell, and I try it, um, but Agda takes it away from it. And so say we have a contrived problem. Write a function that when given two bits returns their sum, and when given two bools returns their disjunction. It must only be defined for those two types. So normally, if it, if it were Say this was an invariant in your program that you wanted to maintain. You didn't want it to have, have an open type class. It's a completely contrived, useless thing. Um, but you, you might write this as a type class normally. But um, here, um, I'm going to define this JDT. And I just say, my, I have this, this type. We, are, we can call it a witness to the type. 
It has a type argument, which I haven't named here. Um, and is bool has, uh, uh, makes that argument bool, and is int makes it int. And so we write this function. We, we started writing the function that, that was specified up there. And I've pattern matched on, on that type. And so I have two holes there, and what are the types in there? Now, if we, if we had some magic way to ask GHC, which we sort of do, um, we would determine that, that the type in that hole is actually a tilde bool is a to a to a. And the tilde is just a type level equality saying, this is all in Haskell, right? um, type level equality saying that a is actually equal to bool. So um, by substitution, you can easily say, this is bool to bool to bool. Now, if we go look at the next one, um, in there, we have an intent to int. So this allows us to write pretty directly what we'd expect in here. Um, and the interesting thing is that just simply by pattern matching on the first argument, we actually have different types for the rest of for the rest of um, for the rest of our, our for the rest of our function. And so um, we can. Another thing is that it restricts pattern matching. The the knowledge that's acquired by pattern matching on one constructor can flow to another constructor. And so here, say we took two of these type arguments, um, the only valid patterns. Um, for this function are is bool, is bool, and is int, is int. The other two combinations, which you might think of writing, are not well typed, and so you simply cannot write them. Um, GHC, up until very recently, uh, would let you write them and give you a warning that it was, it made no sense, but now it actually gives you an error. And so, um, these are generalized um, GADTs. Um, they're like phantom types, but better. Um, not stronger, though. No? What? Not stronger though. They are. Yeah, they're stronger. You can do existentials. You can do existentials, and you can and you can refine types mm -hmm. by pattern matching. The pattern, but pattern matching. Never mind. Um, pattern matching is nice. The types, the types can almost depend on values. You have you have your value, your constructor that um, refines a type index, which will get propagated to the rest of your of your type. Um, and you can use to statically check invariants, as I mentioned, um, things like head and tail only defines on empty lists. Um, an example from Poople, which is a, a library which um, I've been using a lot recently, is basic blocks are closed on entry and exit. And then for program analysis, you want to say that a basic block is defined as something which can, which has a jump at the beginning or has a label at the beginning and a jump at the end, and you can represent that with this. Um, array indices must be less than the length of the array. You can do this in a fairly roundabout way, but you can do that. Um, things like that can be checked statically. And so as there are fancier GDTs, um, inductive families, they actually have dependent types. So that is the main difference.